God bless you all. Shabbat shalom. Me and my wife were supposed to do a message about uh, the Sabbath, and we've gotten so many emails saying, you guys promised and you haven't done it yet. How to keep the Sabbath, and of course, the one way is, is come to the house of the Lord. That's what they did in uh, the time of Yeshua. Uh, says, Paul says, as it was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath. See? So you're keeping Shabbat today. Amen. My glasses, that's what I'm missing. Hang on. Oh, no, I've got it. I couldn't see them. Praise the Lord. Uh, we're going to be going through a lot of different scriptures today, and Psalm 83 is going to be one of those. Um, but if you have your Bible, I'd like to start on uh, the book of Exodus, chapter 15. I'll read to you in both English and in Hebrew both. Not that anybody probably understands Hebrew, but there's a reason for it. It says, Az Yeshia Moshe Uvene Yisrael et Hashira, which means that Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord and said. And it actually literally says that uh, the children of Israel, they were going to sing the song. Hazot Hashem, or the God's divine name, they are Ashra. This means I will sing in Hebrew. It's a future tense. Ashra, Laramai Kita Ago, O Susa Kabora Mabeyom. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. And the horse and his rider he has hurled into the sea. This has never been fulfilled. Back when Moses first spoke about this song here, there were 600 horses, 600 riders that were swallowed up by the Red Sea, or Yom Suf, as we say in Hebrew, which means the Sea of Reeds. And including Pharaoh and his army, they were all wiped out. But Moses says he's going to sing about one horse and one rider that God will destroy. I think in the Christian Bible, the New Testament, it says that uh, there is the four horses and they have a rider. That's the one he's going to get victory over. We'll come back to this in just a moment. Let's go ahead and go to Psalm 83. I have two Bibles, a Hebrew with one with me, and I have a King James Bible as well. And sometimes I get picked on about King James because if I correct a translation, I catch a lot of heck from people over there. In Psalm 83, it says here, Keep thou not silent, O God, hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God, for lo, thy enemies make a tumult. It's an uproar. And they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They've raised up their leader. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, Israel, and consulted against thy hidden ones. Sepulecha is how we say that in Hebrew. That's your two witnesses. A lot of people, they think, well, you know, it must be Israel. No, it's not Israel. So, in fact, um, um, one gentleman asked me one time, he said, Steve, do you think that that's the, the rapture bride or, or something like that? I said, how could it be? I said, if the bride's going, then she's gone. Why do they need to take counsel against her? She's already gone. I said, if they're hidden, they're hidden now. And God said that he would send them again, and he did hide them. And there's different doctrines that go around as far as who the two witnesses are. Well, I'll kind of touch on that a little bit, so it, it might bless you a little bit, and I'm not against any different doctrine on it. It's okay. Whatever people want to believe is okay. I personally believe it's Moses and Elijah. Many different reasons, and, but one of the main reasons is, too, is because on Mount Transfiguration, we saw Moses and Elijah, so neither one of them are dead, and they were standing there on either side of what? The golden lampstand. Christ is that. Yeshua is that actual lampstand. 
that the oil comes from. What we see in Zechariah, the two anointed ones, the two olive branches on either side. So he was, they were standing there, and of course they were talking about what was going to happen to Yeshua. And, uh, but anyway, the hidden ones, they have been hidden. Moses has been hidden. Elijah's been hidden. And I know that there's some belief as far as Enoch, and that's okay. I don't have any problem with that. I'd be nice if he came back too. Uh, you know, but uh, the nice thing though know, we can see though when it comes to to any of these, Moses, Elijah, Enoch, whatever the case may be, they're still hidden away by God for a future work that's going to take place. He says here, they have said, Come let us cut them off, that mean Israel, from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. And believe me, we have that problem today. You know, it was uh, Pope Francis recently when he declared that the, there, there is a Palestinian state. When he declared that there is a Palestinian state, immediately, as Brother Paul brought out to you guys, 136 nations also said, we agree that there's a state. Now, the ir irony of this all is that the Pope of Rome says that there's going to be a Palestinian state in light of the fact that the Bible says that you're not to divide Israel. Joel says, don't do it. The Pope of Rome says, we're, we're going to do it. Now, a lot of people are saying, when are they going to have two states? When are we going to see two states in Israel? Is it going to happen or is it not going to happen? It's already happened. Now, the brother in the back there, we, I don't know if you can show the picture of this on here, but we have a photograph of a border crossing that is being constructed from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Now, how many of you guys have ever been to Israel? Raise your hand, just so you get an idea. So you've been up Highway 1 from Ben Gurion into Israel. Now, right now, a lot of people are, are bypassing that through, um, through uh, Modin because of all the construction there. And they mainly, I think they're doing it because they don't really want you to see what's going on there. But we have, this is it here. You can see this here. This is Highway 1. I've watched it now for about two years as they've been widening the highway going up through there. And of course, we've also got a train rail being brought up through there as well. And but on this particular checkpoint, they built these big tunnel things here. And normally you would think that that would go under a mountain. It's not going under a mountain. It's right there in the middle of the highway. Now, on another picture there uh, that we have, this one here, yes. If you look there at the bottom uh, left-hand side of the corner where the concrete wall comes down to the ground, it's a wireless a wire harness coming up to the ground there for the, where the guardhouse was set at. Why are they making a checkpoint from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem? Since when did the Jews have to go through a checkpoint to go to what we consider to be our own land? Now, Brother Begley interviewed uh, uh, it's uh, Shimon Ko, correct, Brother Begley? Now listen to that. And he talks about that because he's lived in Israel pretty much most of his life, if I'm not mistaken. And he says, for 10 years, we've noticed different checkpoints appear in places that was cutting the Jewish people off, putting them behind the line, and, of course, Israel on the other side of the line. Well, this one here is actually cutting off all the Jews in Jerusalem. This, what they're doing is they're preparing Jerusalem for exactly what Shimon Peres wanted back in 1993 when he met with the Vatican and they decided that they would internationalize Jerusalem. But it also fulfills prophecy. In Micah chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Let me take you to that real quick. I'd love for you to see that. So when they talk about, the Pope says that there's going to be a a second state, um, are, are, and they're always talking about, okay, we're going to negotiate for two states. We've already got two states. Anytime you're taking and going this much into building to separate the country, and you're building checkpoints for Jews to go through when Jews should not have to go through a checkpoint to get into the land that's supposed to be theirs, then there's definitely an agreement been done. I don't care how much that the government and I know Netanyahu is under a lot of, uh, a lot of pressure. He's, when he first got elected back in the 90s, there was a sister in uh, Florida who was actually there, and he just got elected. And the people in Israel, they ran through the street, and they cried out, Benny, king of the Jews, Benny, king of the Jews. And I said, it'll never work. I said, as good a man as he is, he will not work. 
and I'll show you why. In Micah chapter 4, verse 6, it says, In that day saith the Lord, I will assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted, and I will make her that was cast off a strong nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from hence uh, from henceforth even forever. Now that's the return of Israel back to their homeland. And now, O tower of the flock and the stronghold, the daughter of Zion, and to thee shall it come even to the first dominion. The kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Now watch what he says. Now why dost thou cry out aloud? God brings us home, and now we're beginning to cry. So that, that's contrary to the, the idea that some people have on the internet that will say that, well, Israel is not supposed to go to the homeland until God brings them back. And, and, and I know, I've got friends that really believe this. They say that the Israel you see today are not really Jews. This, you know, this is not the Jews. It's, they're supposed to come back because they're literalists. They say God says that when he will bring them back. Well, you know, God said to Moses, I have come down to deliver my people. I have heard their cries, and I have come down to bring them out. And then God says, and I'm sending you. God has a way of delivering his people. And our deliverance is at hand. You may not realize it, but you're an obstacle to that. Because you've not gotten yourself ready. Yeshua himself said, Jesus, just in case somebody doesn't know that, and, and I'm not a, you know, you don't have to say Yeshua, okay, just for, you, for the record. He said, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, my people will be blind. until you recognize who you are. There's a few of us that will come in like I came in. But they're walking around blind because you haven't done your job. Whether it's your own life or whether it's your neighbor that you haven't told anything about the gospel of Jesus Christ yet to. I have stood there in the woods in Israel and the Orthodox rabbis will be sitting there and they'll be pacing back and forth. Kol Hazman Adonai, Kol Hazman Adonai. How much longer, Lord? And they wonder why God doesn't seem to hear their prayers. In 2004, God spared my life from a suicide bomber where I walked down the sidewalk with her. And then the Lord told me to go and move me out from her direction. And she blew herself out. I live there during the Antifada. I know what it's like. But the reason why we have not had our eyes opened yet is because he's waiting for his bride to recognize who she is. And you're holding it. It matters to me because it's my people. And I love you very dearly. But this is something you've got to do. You've got to tell everyone you possibly can that Jesus Christ came in this world. He died for you. He gave his life for you. He's not willing to be prepared. He is long-suffering. And even with Israel, do you, do you know why we're blind in the first place? You know, when Moses took years ago, and he says, God says to him, he says, if they were crying for water, we came across, we come out of the wilderness, or come out of Egypt, and we cross the Red Sea, and we come up to this place called Meribah. And my fathers were there crying and saying, we have no water, you've brought us out here only to die. And God says to Moses, take the, take the elders of Israel, the Levites, and come out to the rock. And this is not 38 years later where he tells him to speak to the rock, but he says, smite the rock that it bring forth its waters. It was a prophecy. 
We are not a chosen people because we're better than you. We were chosen to reject him. We were chosen so that he could become, so that the life that was forfeited in the Garden of Eden by Adam and Eve, that was living inside of him, he is that tree of life. He is the eighth Chaim in the, in the Garden of Eden. And Adam and Eve forfeited that. And God had to have a way to bring that life back, to restore that life that was in Adam and Eve, had to be restored in you. And in us, Brother Hill was speaking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He talked about the fire. Do you know what was inside of Adam and Eve? God called them Ish and Isha. Ish is what we call Adam as a man. But it literally comes from the word, the fire of God. Alap Yoshim, in the middle of his name is Yod, for the divine name of God. As most Christians say Yahweh, but we know we can't really say it as a gift. We don't know how to say it, and a lot of people think we can. But clearly, as Zephaniah says, the time will come when he will restore a pure language to the people, where we will all be able to call upon that divine name. And he says what will happen is that Israel is to pass the armies. Isha is what he called Eve. Not Chava, Isha. She was filled with the spirit of Almighty God. The fire of God was in her like it was in her husband. He didn't make her a lesser creature, by the way, either. When God taken, he formed and he made Eve. It says he taken, in Hebrew it says, min ish. He took from the fire of Hashem and he made Isha. In fact, if he didn't make Isha, we would not have Yah today because it was between him two, the Yod and the Hay that makes the divine name of God was, was made right there between the two of them. So that's why it says that the, when, when they go to get married, the husband will, shall leave his father and mother, and they two shall cleave together, and they, the, two, the twain shall be one. The rabbis and sages said, if you take the yod and the hay out of their names, you have nothing but a devouring fire left over. You have to have God, or it will not work. You know when God said to her, and I'm kind of going off topic to begin with, when the fall comes, of course Adam, he's quick to pass the buck. The woman can give me, she did it. He says to Eve, you will turn to your husband. You know how hard it was for him to say that to her? And then he said, and he will rule over you. Brothers, that wasn't a divine decree. She had a relationship with him. Just like that. Yeah, And because of the fall, God knew they were both without the Holy Spirit now. And because he was bigger. And not so much maybe with Adam and Eve, it was a prophetic utterance that he says, You shall You will turn, literally, you will turn to your husband. Even the Septuagint translated that one right. You'll see it in the King James as well. It just kind of because they didn't understand the spiritual application of this. And he will rule over you. It was never meant, meaning he'll be your boss. But when Yeshua came, he restored that. He restored the relationship that was broken between God and mankind. That's what Adam's name actually means when you read the word Adam, Adon, and say, his name. Because when he created them, he said, That means he breathed into the nostrils of this man, or mankind, 
his own life. The word Chayim is Yahweh's life in a plural form. Because you know why? All the animals got Chai, which was God's life too. They had a nefesh, they had a soul. But with Adam, the mankind, he put both man and woman in the same body. And then he did the operation. And it's interesting because, you know, it says in the Bible about Adam, it says that um, it's not good for the man to be alone. This is what Yeshua went through. Adam was experiencing everything that Yeshua experienced. He longed for that relationship for his bride. Just like Yeshua has longed for that relationship with you. Adam was willing to lay his life down. In Hebrew, the word that is used there is like a coma. Oh, I had to put him in to do the surgery to open him up to bring forth his bride. Yeshua on Calvary was put into that same type of sleep, willingly. And his side was torn open by that Roman soldier. So that the life that he meant for every one of you could come out of him. That's why in the upper room it says there were cloven tongues like as a fire that rested upon each one. And it was for men and women both. He's the same yesterday, today, and perhaps. Let's go back on track. So they built this checkpoint in Israel. Boy, we're going to do a puzzle of these words. And Micah says here, verse 9, God asks the question, Now why dost thou cry out aloud, speaking to Israel, Is there no king in thee? God doesn't ask questions for no reason. He, he says here, Micah, verse 6, he's returned our people to their homeland, and he says, I'm never going to leave you again, and I'm with you. And now God says, why do you cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? You see, the way Israel sinned and left God is the way we have to go back, and you're no different. If you have sinned and you have left God and you are in a backslidden condition, the only way you're going to get back to God is to go back the way you left Him. Where you left Him at is where you'll find Him at. And that's what Israel did, and so God asked us the question. He said, is there no king in thee? Because when Samuel the prophet was on the earth, Israel said, we want a king to lead us. And Samuel said, God's not pleased. He goes before God and God says to Samuel, they've not rejected you, they've rejected me. This is why Israel fulfilled biblical prophecy when the people ran through the streets when Benjamin Netanyahu was, was elected prime minister of Israel in the 90s. And they said, Benny, king of the Jews, he was anointed by my heavens as a king of Israel and prophesied over back when he was only, I think, 18 years old when his brother Jonathan had been killed. And, 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 and um, Michael goes over to to Israel, not even knowing anything about the Netanyahu family. And the Lord leads him there and he anoints him with oil and he said, prophesies over him and says, you will be prime minister over Israel not once but twice. Right. Yeah. And I don't know anything about Brother Michael Evans other than that. I've never listened to his ministry, but I've heard that. But the reason he was anointed king was because he cannot work as a king. God has to show us that a king will not work. So God asked us the question, is there no king in you? We're surrounded by our enemies on every side. Hezbollah, it's kind of interesting, Hezbollah says not too long ago, a few months ago, they said, uh, uh, we're not ready to go war with Israel. Israel bombed and they killed the Iranian general and they killed one of the high-ranking officials of Hezbollah. And of course, and Hezbollah retaliates and then they say, oh, by the way, don't send any bombs over here because we're not ready to go to war with you yet. Do you 
guys not notice these comments they make? Yeah. Excuse, excuse me, what are, we, what are you going to be ready to do a war as soon as Pope Francis says we can't end war time? Wow. Don't think that he's, I mean, he looks like a nice guy. Kisses the babies and everything else, you know. But he runs this world. At least he'd like you to think so. So Hezbollah says this, that, you know, we're not ready for a war yet. But here recently they just jumped up there again and they said, you know, don't think that we won't displace one and a half million of you guys. You know, I was up in uh, northern Israel about eight months ago and I was speaking to one of the top UN officials there. And he asked me, he said, Steve, when you come back to Israel, because I was coming back to the United States at the time, he says, when you come back to Israel, are you planning on staying in Israel or are you planning on staying in the Golan? I thought the Golan was part of Israel. Well, I'm just asking which one you plan on staying in. So the borders are being redrawn? We won't go there. The borders are already redrawn. That's why they're building all the infrastructure. Let me look at the next verse that he says here in Micah here. This is another one that should shock the Jewish people, my Jewish brethren. And believe me, on our channel, Stephen Benin, ben 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 ben, whatever my channel's name is, I don't even know. There's a lot of Israelis that listen to this. There are a lot of Jewish people. There are Jewish people that have believed. They write me privately, Orthodox Jews that cannot say they converted because of fear of what will happen to them there. It's okay, they'll be able to say it before long. We're all going to get persecuted for it anyway. But they, they do listen. In fact, the other day, my wife will tell you, we were walking down Benuda Street, and this guy comes out, got long hair, long beard, he walks over to me, and at first I thought, you know, maybe he was in need, you know, and so we figured we'd help him, and he, he starts speaking to me in Hebrew, and he says, I want you to know, we watch you on the film, and he said, you need to know that Elohim was with you. Micah chapter nine, or excuse me, chapter four, verse nine. The next sentence is the fatal question to Israel. After he says that there's no king in thee, he says, "Is thy counselor perished? Is it Yeshua called by Isaiah, the counselor, the prince of peace, the mighty God?" He's making us think. You rejected me as being your leader. You didn't want a prophet, you wanted a king. So now I'm going to let you see that your king's not going to deliver you in battle. Now he has to take us back to what happened in 70, or not 70, but back 2,000 years ago before the temple was destroyed. One thing I always ask my Jewish brethren is this question here. Listen, every time that we have ever been scattered as a people in our history, we never got scattered because we were such a great people and God was so proud of us. We got scattered because we did something wrong. We were in sin. We were in idolatry. Israel, by the way, was the most religious looking and appearance nation on the planet when Yeshua got there. Religious to the T. Just like America. Outward appearance is not what matters. God says that he was looking for sincere repentance, not sacrifice. <clears throat> but yet they offered more bulls and goats than you can imagine. That's not what he was looking for. That's not what he's looking for with us. He's looking for sincere repentance. Change of heart. That's what he wants. Then he says here, her pains have taken thee as a woman in travail. Be in pain and labor and bring forth the daughter of Zion like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city and thou shalt dwell in the field and thou shalt go even to Babylon. Therefore shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thy enemies. The hand of our enemy is in Babylon. And today the spiritual Babylon today is in Rome. And Rome's right hand warrior is in the United States. 
That's, that's hard to say. But it's no harder than us saying that we ended up touring the Messiah. We have to admit what we do wrong. We can't just put, pass it off as a power of better reason and think everything's okay. When it's not. But he says that there. And then, what's interesting, if you take, we're looking, let's go back to Psalm 83 real quick. Paul, keep me close to all time because I don't pay attention. Because notice what he said. They're going to go to Babylon to be redeemed. Isn't it interesting where Netanyahu, well, Shimon Perez picked it all off for us. Started the negotiations with Rome. The Pope got involved in all of this. Let's go back to verse 4. They said, come let us cut off them from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in our members. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against the, who is? The tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites and Moab and the Hagarenes. Now, Edom has tabernacles, churches. What are those tabernacles? Well, Let's take a look at Obadiah. If you want to see who the confederacy is, then list all the confederates that they are. But notice that the Ishmaelites are with them, the, the Moab, the Hagarines, the Gibal, Ammon, and the Amalek, and the Philistines. And here's another interesting thing about uh, Psalm 83, because people say, what do you think about the Psalm 83 war? The Psalm 83 war is not so much a war. It is a war. It is a war that is coming against Israel, but they're begging God not to keep silent. But does it mean God will intervene? He will intervene, but maybe not at the beginning. We have to wake up. In Obadiah, I won't tell you which chapter to go to, I'll let y'all figure it out now. <laughs> Verse 7 All the men of thy confederacy, and here's the, here's the ones you remember, they're confederate. With that, right? And now we'll see what it says here. In Obadiah, how are the things of Esau, verse 6, how are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought out? All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding him. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom and the understanding out of the mount of Esau? So the question is, is who is Esau? Who is Edom? We see that there is a confederacy with Edom, which is Esau, by the way. Edom is the mount in which Esau lived on. And, and by the way, when the Bible says that God loved Jacob and he hated Esau, and we see all these passages about Esau, how evil, and how God is going to judge him, and God is going to do this. But Esau lived and died a normal death. It was prophecy. Esau is prophetic. Jacob is prophetic. Obadiah clearly teaches us this. Let's look at the prophecy as it fulfills itself, though, in what he says. And thy mighty men, O Keman, shall be dismayed to the end that every one that, uh, of the mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. Verse 10, for thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. When Jacob came up, it looked like he saw was going to join the violence, but he didn't. But God is saying here, your violence against your brother, he's going to cut you off. What violence did he do there? Let's see what it says. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. But thou shouldst not have looked on the day of thy brother, in the day that thou became a stranger, neither in the day that he became a stranger, neither shouldst thou have, have uh, rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. That is 70 AD. The house of Israel had already gone into captivity. 700 years before that time. 
So Obadiah clearly identifies who Esau is. And, he, and he's saying that Esau is the one that is standing aside, but he's saying he's standing as one of them. And he mentions Judah, and he says, of course, it's your brother Jacob. The house of Judah was the one that was there when Yeshua came and preached the gospel. When the apostles preached it and they rejected it, the Jews rejected it. And because they would not receive the Messiah that God had sent them, which they were prophesied not to, because even Yeshua said, until the fullness of the Gentiles would come in. Also, Paul reiterates the same words. He says that the fullness of the Gentiles must come in first before the prophecy can be fulfilled about the olive tree. The branches will be regrafted in again. All right? So what we find out here is that Esau is there. And of course, anybody who knows anything about history, let's read a little bit more, though. But thou shalt not have stood, excuse me, and not have looked on the day of thy brother, the day that he became a stranger. Neither shouldst thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldst thou have uh, spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou shouldst not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldst not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Anybody ever seen the Ark of Titus in Rome? You see there, I've been there, I've taken the picture myself, repairing the temple treasures. And he's just said right here who did that. And he calls them Esau. Titus, the Roman general, came down. And a lot of people say, well, you know, it really wasn't the Romans that caused the destruction of Jerusalem. It was the army that he had from Syria that caused it. Well, of course, they were married. Does anybody know anything about Hadad? Hadad was the one royal child of Esau that was not killed by David and his men. He escaped the sword of David and certain of his servants, and they went into Egypt, and he was raised by the Pharaoh of Egypt. That is in your Bible. You can find it in the book of Kings. Uh, Hadad. He was Esau's blood descendant. He survived. When he becomes of age, just like Moses, he says to Pharaoh, because he's raised as a son of Pharaoh, he said, I'd like to go back to my people. He says, but I've given you everything. He says, but I know, but I want to go back. He allowed him to go. Where did he go? To Syria. He became the king of Syria. No wonder why the Romans have a good relationship with the Syrians, even to this day. In fact, Basra Assad sent a letter to Pope Francis about a year ago, and he said, this would be the conditions that I'd be willing to surrender. Why does he send it to Pope Francis? I thought, was he on the battlefield or something? They all go to the Pope of Rome. I mean, you ever notice the Bible says, he that goes in and out. Only they come in and out, will no more come in and out. Because every world leader goes to the Pope of Rome. Vladimir Putin's going this week. And by the way, speaking about checkpoints in Israel that the Jews have to go through, coming out of Vienna into the Czech Republic, all the old borders are no longer in existence. Well, they're there, but they don't, they don't work anymore. Now they're building state-of-the-art checkpoints from Vienna to the Czech Republic. I thought the Czech Republic was part of the European Union. My wife lived under a communist regime. In Lithuania, friend of ours, his wife from there, their family just said the other day, they said, why are all the American troops here in our country? Well, we see them all over Eastern Europe. Why are they there? Why is all these planes flying overnight scaring the dickens out of us and stuff? What's going on here? You know, I did it, I did it when Putin came up missing for those 10 days, I did a, a YouTube video called Putin is not dead, he is only, you know, he prepares for war. I got a letter, a nice little letter from the Kremlin. <laughs> After he came out, and he said, wasn't from him, but one of whoever it was that was from there. I don't even know who they were. They said, we just wanted you to know you were the only journalist that got it right.
he was in the bunkers. And the thing is, is they're going to have a war, but sometimes I can't help but wonder if they don't all know about it. Just like with, with Hezbollah, Nasrallah. Nasrallah says to Israel, we're not ready to do the war yet. Why are they building checkpoints in Europe? Brother Paul spoke to you guys a long ago about ten regions of the world. It's true. Your new world order is going to have ten regions. Russia, by the way, gets control back of part of that Eastern Europe and stuff. But see, the people will not go along with it. Neither will the Jews go along with the idea of their land being divided. And this is what's funny. The checkpoints are being built. The lines have already been drawn. The deals are already signed. The Pope of Rome has already signed the deal with Israel for two states. Why do you think he announces it? Why do you think he's coming to the United States to speak at your, at the, here in this country here? He's coming to speak here at the Senate or Congress, whichever it is. I'm going to mix up sometimes. In Israel's Knesset. Why is he coming? He's going to the United Nations setting up the new world order. He didn't know he was a boss. And everybody would thank you. But he's coming there to do that. And Europe would never accept going back under Soviet control. So what they do is they just have a war. Gosh, we lost. That's why Russian troops are here again. Same thing with Israel. They can build the checkpoints all they want. And the people go to resist. Syria will come in, Hezbollah will come in, and Super Pope will send NATO. <laughs> and God will send his two witnesses. <laughs> how, how much time is that? Anybody know? 20 minutes. Oh, the good part comes now. Praise the Lord. Brother, is your name Elijah? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll do it for the fire. I'll do it for the There's a lot of rumors going around, guys, by the way, but it's kind of funny. Brother Paul puts out that video, the two witnesses are in Gethsemane. <laughs> that was good. Because, you know, the two olive trees there that are over 2,000 years old, I really believe that they're there for, for two reasons. I believe that they're there as a witness that Yeshua prayed there. But whatever he touches is blessed. Whatever he touches has life. And he said that there was two olive trees on either side of the golden lampstand. He must have probably prayed right between the two of them. And they're still sitting there to this day as a, as a biblical fact that he'll send two witnesses to Israel. All right, now, let me just finish this one part here in Micah and we'll move on. For the day of the Lord is near upon the heathen, or the Gentiles. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink down, and they shall be as though they had not been. Now we do have a picture back there if the brother is able to find it. There's one of the upper room where Pope Francis did the, what do they call it in the Catholic Church? They call it a communion or, or a Eucharist or something like that. We, we like to say the Last Supper, but, you know, that's because I was born in Alabama. I mean, Actually, Mama wanted me to have a proper birth. She took me across the state line to a hospital. <laughs> anyway, I'll leave that as a mystery for a minute. Did you know, though, that verse 16 is a prophecy that you have actually seen written in the Bible that is fulfilled right before your very eyes in this day now? He says here in Micah, because remember, he's speaking of Esau. He's speaking of Adam. And clearly, Adam is defined in the book of Obadiah as Rome. Because Titus, the Roman general, is the one that comes down. And Titus, the Roman general, is the one that battles against Israel. And Titus, the Roman general, is the one that takes the treasures of Israel. He is the Esau as God. See, here's what's funny. We think Titus came down. Oh, he's a Roman general. God tells you he came down. 
He said, Esau did. He said, why did you do this to your brother? I used to always wonder, especially in America, you see Italian people and Jewish people and they all look alike. And I said, are you, are you Jewish? No, I'm Italian. Are you Italian? No, I'm Jewish. You know, understand, God is in the business of saving anybody and everybody. He wanted to save Esau as well. He loved him. Well, I shouldn't say that. Lord, forgive me. The Bible says he hated him from his mother's womb. Correction. Brother Paul used to tell me that, right? He didn't love him. He knew what he was. <laughs> but nonetheless, the thing is, is God's desire is that whosoever will will come to him. Whether you be Roman or not, his desire is that you come to him. That you know him as your own Savior. So I'm not picking on the Catholic people when I say this. In fact, as, like Brother Paul deals the same thing, we have many, many Catholic people that have tuned in. God is dealing with their hearts. But he says here, for as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. So God says Esau has drunk upon his holy mountain. And what happened? You know, the, the, the upper room was actually under the control of the Israelis. It was actually under the control of one of our rabbis. It is called the, uh, the uh, Mount Zion. It is the Tomb of David area there. This is actually under the control of the Jews. But as they begin to do the negotiations, according to Daniel, and by the way, when I say they have a two-state solution already, I don't say that this is Daniel's covenant that has been signed. I don't know the answer to that. I do know this, though, the prince that shall come, if you remember, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, shall be of the people who destroy the city and the sanctuary. And Titus, the Roman general, destroyed the city and the sanctuary. And he was aware from Rome. And we find out in Obadiah, God puts it in Esau's hand for destroying what the temple, destroying Israel, sending them into captivity. And again, we find out it was the Romans that did it. And then you wonder why in 325, Constantine, along with the Mithras priests, they formed the first so-called religion, mixing the Christianity. That's where it's birth comes from. And that's hard, but that's, you know, we went through it. And God knows, I mean, there's been true believers all along. And he's always looking. You know when the Bible says, come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins? There's still time. You know he says that though about Israel? That's what he says it to. Come out of her, my people. Israel is always called my people. In Revelation, I think it's 18.4, you have it written there. It's also, by the way, that is written in the Torah as well. Come out of her, my people. Because why? God knew that we were going to make a covenant with Rome. But he also knows we're blind. You're not supposed to be blind. But as Brother Hale quoted about the Laodicean church, you are, the Laodicean church says, I am rich and have need of nothing. But knowest thou not thou art blind, miserable, and naked, and you don't even know it. That's the sad part. You have to keep in mind, because God is getting ready to bring judgment on this earth of the two witnesses. The church has gotten themselves in the same condition, not individuals, but the church, is in the same condition as Israel was 2,000 years ago. My fathers were blinded for the purpose to bring forth that life. Today, the churches are blinded and they're going to crucify him again. And they don't realize they are. They're crucifying him with what? With their doctrines. Isn't it interesting? In Revelation chapter 11, you have a beautiful verse. We have it in Zechariah. That there are two anointed ones that God's going to sin. Also in Matthew 24, when Yeshua is talking about all the things that are going to happen, he says, when this gospel... When this evangelion, in Greek it says, when this evangelion is preached to all the world, then the end will come. And I used to always think, you know, growing up, and in, in, in I've been in different types of churches uh, throughout my life, when I first, I was the first Jew in my family to believe, 
But when I did believe, I went to all these different churches and stuff, and I always think to myself, which one's going to have it right? Which one has it right? Undoubtedly none of them. Now there's truth in every one of them. I gave my life to Christ at London Baptist Church in Castleberry, Alabama at eight years old. My mother made the mistake of visiting a church, a Jewish girl with her friend, because she coerced her into going. And when that preacher began to preach, he'd be all, he, he was like, go to hell. You want to be saved? Go to God. <laughs> I was eight years old, and I listened to that. I was about three rows back from the front. And when he got to the end, he made an altar call. I'm like this, trying to keep them little old folks out of my way to get down to the front. My mama didn't ever go back to that church again either. <laughs> but I got saved. So I thank God for the back. In fact, the, the, the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, I met him about a year ago. A friend of mine is his secretary, and he has a passion for Israel. And God bless him. So it's, it is, the, the, never would I agree about it in speaking here in, 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 in the facility that, it's, that, that, he, that he's a part of here, especially with the things that I say, because he knows that I stay on the edge all the time. Uh, he read the book that I wrote, Israel, that's still God's people, and I think he's read the book that I'm super as well. But, uh, but he doesn't get away, with, get away with saying as much as I say. But anyway, God bless him in this church for allowing the call to have him in the But anyway, going right back to the part, when you've got to minister this dyslexic, it's a rough road to follow me, I'm sorry. Going back to uh, Obadiah here, though, when they drank on the mountain there, that was fulfilled when the Pope of Rome had communion there. That was the prophecy God was speaking about. People that do not realize how much power and influence he has. In Israel, and I don't condone some of the practices my brethren do, but let me just share with you some of the things that we do. We hold burial sites very sacred. And they should. We see them in the Bible. Abraham was buried here, and Sarah was buried in the lot in Hebron. So we know these things. But I don't believe in worshiping the dead, and I don't believe in praying to the dead. But the Jews will come and pray they consider it a holy place if one of our prophets was buried in a certain place. David's tomb is believed to be at the same site of the Last Supper. The Jewish people supposedly own this. We don't anymore. All of Mount Zion is given to the Rome. We had no referendum. We protested, we did everything we could, but you couldn't stop it. They sent special forces to the tomb of David a week after Pope Francis had the communion upstairs. And I don't have a problem with him having one upstairs. He has a right to do that. That's, it's a Christian gathering place. Nothing wrong with that. I don't have a problem with that. It's the way it was done. In Judaism, the Christians come and do something in a, in, a, in a holy place that we consider sacred, we are to never pray there again. They sent the special forces in to the tomb of David, and they threw all the Jews out. So that they could hold a communion service in the tomb of David. We were forced to leave. I was not there at that time. I didn't actually be a part of this happening because I would, if I'd have been there, I'd have ever. I'd, I'd call Brother Paul Begley, get it loud, brother. <laughs> they were thrown out, and one of the sisters, as she was being made to go out, she says, Is this because of the Pope of Rome? And he just silently says, Kid, which means yes.
And then they had a communion service inside the tomb of David. Now, you may not realize the significance of this. About a year, or several years before this, Pope Benedict was given the official seat at the tomb of David for the Pope of Rome. What does this mean? David was the king of Israel. The son of David is supposed to be Yeshua, and he is. And he is the one that sits on the throne of David. There is no vicarious Gilead Gilead in Israel. But our governors bow down and allow it. When they put an official seat for the Pope of Rome there, they in essence said that he is the king of Israel. You wonder why that they say an Antichrist is a Jew? That's why. They give him that official seat. But what's interesting, they put it at a grave site. So this king is a dead king. And so God says here, you have drunk down on my holy mountain. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall I that you even drink continually. The Gentiles. That's what it means. The Galilean. God said they would keep on doing it. I don't share dreams or visions very often, but I will share one with you. And then I'm going to try quickly to add some more thank thoughts in here. Brother Paul, just let me know when to stop them. I've got a little more hurt my feelings. Maybe a little bit, but not too bad. I was on Mount Zion. And in this dream, I seen the Orthodox community pray. And then I saw Christians pray. And I'm thinking, that's nice. And as I'm watching it, I'm thinking, oh, I do. You know, and I thought, the best thing to do is pray. So I, I prostrated myself to the face of the earth. Like David did. You see David in the Bible. Jews still do this. And I lay down on the ground. And I did. It was like, if you've been in Israel, you have a lot of desert. Everything's rocky and stuff. Everything was rocky there. And as I'm laying there praying, I look up and there's a stone in front of me about that, that one. And I look up at that stone. And in Hebrew, I'll tell you in English, but in Hebrew it comes across on the stone. There is a man drinking on my holy mountain. And then it's like an amber fire that come across the stone and it went away. And then it came across again and it says, you are to remove him. I'm not nobody. And I don't know what it means. I'm not an interpreter and I don't interpret them. I just tell you what I saw. I don't know why he said that. And then I got up and I began to walk around. And I began to look for this guy. I'm like, he's drinking on God's holy mountain. Of course, one person sent me an email. That is not God's holy mountain. You need to read your Bible. My holy mountain Zion. That's a quote I quote in the Bible. And I'm looking all around. And I'm going through the people, just zigzagging through. And suddenly I see this man. And his back's to me. And just before I get to him, he turns around. He takes the wine glass and pours the wine out. And he says, I've stopped. I said, you have to leave. And he was very arrogant. He says, for how long? It's a strange dream, you know. I mean, even in the dream, I'm thinking, this is weird, you know. And I'm like, I don't know. But you must leave. And he left. And I knew the man was safe. I'm not saying he took on hope and roads and you know, it's just like a man. But he was saving himself. Now I've got to show you. I mentioned to you, and I'll try to do this quicker. How much time do I have for the point? Okay. Moses and Elijah are going to come. And I want to share with you two passages real fast. One is going to be in Exodus 34, verse 10. The other is going to be in Exodus 
chapter 3. There's many more, by the way. I told you Exodus 15 has not been fulfilled. Moses is actually going to deal with the Antichrist. Only one I'm going to read to you in Hebrew. And I'm going to tell you what it says. Moshe Echad, he bine anochi bo em banig Yisrael. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, or to the children of Israel. Ve'amati lechem elokai avotechem, shelachem yareachem, ve'amu li ima shemu. And when I go to them, and I'm just paraphrasing because I'm translating to Hebrew, when I go to them, they will say to me, what is your name? My Shimon. He says, what do I tell them? And then of course the famous words, Ihaye Asha Ihaye. Literally, we translate that, I am that I am. It carries a more prophetic statement. God is saying, I am going to prove who I am. Okay? Now, here's the interesting thing about the verse, though. Moses says, they will ask me, what is your name? What do I tell them? God doesn't give them his name. He just tells them I'm going to prove who I am. Do you know Israel never asked Moses what his name is? We have no biblical record where they ever asked. But in this day, Israel wants to know what is his name. We don't know. And there's a lot of good ideas. Nehemiah Gordon, I know Nehemiah. They call him Nehemiah. Nehemi. He says that he found something in the Torah. I appreciate all that. I sent him a letter and I told him, I said, Nehemiah, it can't be right. Because Zephaniah said, he'll restore it when we're surrounded by our enemies. And we're about to be defeated. It is Zephaniah. God tells you when you will know that name. Israel's going to ask. That's going to be the thing they're going to ask the two witnesses. That's, they're, you know, they're not, I thank God for miracles. I've seen the dead raised. I've seen the cripples walk. My mother, being a Jewish woman, believed Yeshua is the Messiah before she died. Amen. My mother was totally blind. And he spoke to me one day when I was on a tractor and he said, pray for your mother's eyes. She had 20-20 vision by the time I got to her that evening. He didn't only give her physical sight, he gave her natural, uh, spiritual sight as well. And then she recognized who her Messiah was. She was a quadriplegic. And I prayed for her. I never asked God for that. My mother died. About 40 minutes later, they got word to me, your mother was dead, you need to go to the hospital. I said, I'm not going. My family said, are you out of your mind? She died in the hospital. I, oh, oh, yeah. I said, I'm no better than Ray Hill. I said, they promised her her whole family. And I went down in the woods and I knelt down and I said, God, if I've ever believed you, I must believe you today. My mother, is a drunkard. She doesn't know you. She's crippled. She's blind. And God raised her from the dead. Yeah. Most people, when they talk about Enoch and uh, Elijah as being the two witnesses, they really use it because of they say that. Enoch never tasted death, and you have to taste death. I say the same thing about Elijah. I say, what about the bride? Something doesn't match up, does it? Because the rapture, and I'm not, it don't matter to me if you're pre, post, me, I don't care. 
I don't care if he comes way long before any of these, as long as I get to go. Okay. Church has been divided too long over, don't have no fellowship with them because they are being straight then, of course, you got that one. They're really wiped out, man. They don't even believe in the rapture. And then they hate each other because of that. Why? They don't hate each other. What, what difference does it matter when he comes? The thing is, is the Bible says there will be those that are alive and remain until he, he comes. And they don't got to come back and die. And neither does Elijah and neither does Enoch. But when you read that scripture, it's appointed of one that wants to man to die. It's speaking about Yeshua. And the whole thing is about the prophecy. Does he have to die more than once? No, it's only appointed for him once to die. Not multiple times. So when Moses says, they're going to ask me, what is your name? And they never ask him, it's not been fulfilled. When he says, I will sing. I'm sure Adonai Ga'ago'o. I will sing a personal pronoun. I will sing unto the Lord that he has cast the horse and his one rider into the sea of the Antichrist, he's going to get victory over that guy. Now, here's what I'll close with right here. In Genesis, excuse me, Exodus 34, verse 10, the King James Bible says here, and he said, Behold, I make a covenant. This is God speaking to Moses. Before all thy people, I will do marvels. Now, those of you that are diehard KJV, and I'm a diehard myself, it's not translated correctly. Even the Jews know it's not. They, the Jews, we broke down and changed it to marble stir. And you know why? Moses died. Let me read the rest of it and I'll explain. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with you. The correct way to translate the word is wondrous. And you even have that in your margin of your Bible. So King James knew what the right word was. They just put marvels. The Jews put marvels too. You know why? Because they said he died and he never did anything greater than the parting of the Red Sea. How could he really do anything greater? God said he's going to be greater. Well, maybe God was making a mistake. I don't know what God was thinking. Why did God say that? I don't know. And so we argue about it. But the wine said they didn't know he was coming back. Now, whether it be literally Moses comes back or as the spirit off of Moses comes on somebody, I don't know the answer to that. But the thing is, is God said he's going to do wonders like it's never been seen before. And it's terrible wonders. Now, how do you know it's Elijah? Yeshua says, Matthew 17, they come down off the Mount Transfiguration, they've been talking to Moses and Elijah, they're all blown away by it and everything. Get it real quick, let's build some churches for you guys. It's not what God said. You don't need to build another big church. You need to sell us to Christ. Okay? Here's the final comment. Moses has never fulfilled Exodus 34. Those wonders have not been done as of yet. Jesus said in Matthew 17, just paraphrasing, they ask him, doesn't the scribe say that Elias, which is Greek for Elijah, so we'll just say Elijah, doesn't the scribe say that Elijah must first come? And Jesus says, keep in mind, John the Baptist is dead, by the way. Truly, Elijah shall first come and restore all things. Why does there need to be a restoration done? Because we have to be doctrine. How is he going to get a bride ready? I used to think that the two witnesses are only to, to the Jews. But you know, clearly their message goes worldwide. The whole world hates them, except the little remnant. Little remnant in that belief. Brother wrote me recently. He said, you have no business correcting the translation of the King James Bible. It was perfectly done. I said, if it's perfect, why does King James Bible say that Elijah must first come and restore all things? If it's perfectly done, no restoration is needed. 
translators are human. They're brothers, they're sisters, they mean well. Maybe an agenda. I don't know what the case may be. Jeremiah says in the King James Bible, in chapter 8, verse 8, um, actually in King James, you put it, the, the, the pen of the scribe is in vain. In Hebrew, it's kashal. The pen of the scribe is a liar. The scribe is the guy that just causes it. So he changes the word. Like our rabbis, they admitted it. Well, we changed it. We don't think it's really wonders because Moses didn't do it in grade. No, it's wonders. And they're coming. And they're going to set it in order. And those that do not hear them, they're not making it. And not every Jew in Israel will believe either. Only a remnant. When Paul says, all Israel shall be saved, that's all the Israel, all the remnant, all the, those that God foreknew from the time of the early age till now, that's all of Israel. You are all Israel. Thank you so much, Lord.